Okay. Well, I think we can probably start to get to get things going. Um, so I'll try to share with you today um, uh, my experience and uh, uh, what I know, uh, also what industry has been doing, and uh, uh, try to get into some details what you may already have heard from application people of the uh, ICP companies that you're working with, and uh, uh, try to put some sense what stands behind for you know, certain things that um, uh, we need to take into account when running difficult samples. Uh, as an example of uh, <clears throat> what is difficult, right? So I try to focus on uh, uh, two main applications, considering that the people or users who come into the Gulf Coast Conference are mainly dealing with petrochemical uh, samples. So one of the uh, difficult samples is different kind of oils, and not just oils, lubricating oils, so that's relatively easy. But you get something like that in your lab, so that's like, wow, right? So that creates some kind of a challenge. Crude oil also, you know, have some particles, some sulfur, it also creates a uh, type of challenge. So this is a relatively <laughs> Uh, new type of samples, I mean, not new, new, but uh, the one that relatively recently was brought to uh, arena of analysis, uh, it contains high grease and fatty content. So basically, it's a discharge oil from uh, any food chains, so they're being collected and then being regenerated to produce any um, product that we use, biodiesel or things like that. So in the process of regeneration, you have to analyze it. So this is a very, pretty nasty sample. So the, the reason it's shown like that is they are solidified at room temperature. So it's, a, it's a, like a wax. So then you have to dissolve it and you have to know how to handle it. And they need to be analyzed at the low level. So when this type of matrix is combined with analytical requirement to do low level, it certainly creates a challenge. The, so that was organic type of samples. The inorganic is what's most uh, commonly now used in uh, petrochemical industry, industry uh, referred to as fracking waters or hydraulic fracturing waters, or if we analytically describe it as samples with high amount of salt, or TDS, which stands for total dissolved solids. If these samples also will contain some particles, that will be even more challenging. So this is two things that I, I brought in, and you're more than welcome to we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation so we can discuss your particular challenges and we'll try to see how we can address it. When you get your instrument, whatever you've got in your lab from any ICP manufacturer, the modern instrumentation is pretty solid. You can, you know, there will be some variation in how fast it runs or what type of chain rate you've got. But nowadays, the hardware on all the instruments are capable of handling difficult type of samples with a different level of degree. So the main focus of what needs to be looked at is the sample reduction components. That you know, small things that's in front of your instrument will determine probably 90%, if not more, of your success of handling the, the tough samples. So it's like you, you get in a car, right? Brand new car. And then you need to drive in the dirty road. But if you have, you know, not the right tires, or if you're driving in the snow, right? You can't do that. So a similar thing here. So you have a good engine, so it has a good capability, but you just need to put the right things there to get the, uh, things going. And we're going to focus on or get in the details. What is the nebulizer? What kind of spray chamber goes with that depending on the type of samples? Uh, also, the torch injector. That's very important. And then we'll, we'll uh, I'll show you the examples. The torch injectors are changing in the wide range of diameters. Uh, I'll show you a bit later. 
One type of injector you use when you run uh, oil samples. Completely different injector you need to run fracking works. And pump, uh, uh, pump tubing materials, uh, material in internal diameter is also playing a, a pretty big role. So when you are running both type of applications, whether it's you know difficult oils and bunker oils, what I showed you, <laughs> looking pretty, pretty nasty, right? And then the uh, hydraulic fracturing samples with high salt, you need what's called high solids capable nebulizer. And I'll show you what it is. Then, if you have particulates, then the nebulizer should be able to handle particulates and just not to clog, right? And if you're looking at the low level, then you need also nebulizer to, uh, uh, to be able to provide you a good sensitivity and precision. So to accomplish all of this in one nebulizer, that's not an easy task. But let's take a look. So there are some high solids capable <coughs> nebulizers on, on the market. And again, you know, uh, some of them are described or claimed by the manufacturer that they're high solids capable. You maybe recognize some of those. So this is, for example, Gem Cole from Garton Elmer. So this is the Gorman Mirror Mist. So this is the V-Spray. So this is the v group from Edgeland. Um, so the common thing between them, they can handle samples with high amount of tolerance of salts. <clears throat> so then we go into the second requirement, which is handling particles. Well, let's see what um, uh, what uh, some of these guys can or cannot do. Concentric. Both of these nebulizers are concentric. When you need to run samples with particulates, they are limited. Can't do that. Well, you can, but you're going to be clogging your samples and stopping the run. So those two guys are gone. So then, when it comes to requirement, what offers you the best sensitivity and precision in addition to others? So, this is very low sensitivity nebulizer. This one is as well. So the others four are pretty decent, but then we need the best. So gem cone is somewhere in between, and uh, a glass V groove as well. So this is, these two nebulizers offer the best sensitivity and precision based on what we see on the market. And this is what they are. <clears throat> so the Optimist Excel is manufactured by uh, TSP, by our company. Mirror Mist Burger is manufactured by Burger Research and being offered by <coughs> many ICT manufacturers. So then let's take a look what kind of, you know, uh, we'll, we'll take a look in more details why these nebulizers are the best for handling tough samples. The second part of the sample introduction system <clears throat> that I mentioned to you is the spray chamber. And you have all these different choices and quite often you're confused because you have a... Just put, all, all of these are cyclonic. You have no baffle cyclonic and baffle is just the internal tube that <clears throat> uh, put inside of the spray chamber. <clears throat> That's what we refer to as baffle. So then, there is another one with baffle, but it's a pretty wide size, 7 millimeter. And then there's the third type. So all of these are Perkinormous styles. I just took it as an example to show you the variety. It has a narrow baffle of 4 millimeters. So what is the reason and where you can use one of those devices? No baffle is a very straight spray chamber, very simple to make for the manufacturers and sometimes you ended up with this spray chamber because it just came with the instrument. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't mean that it's correct. Uh, in, in spite of the simplicity to make and relatively lower cost, it gives, because it doesn't have this internal tube, there is more sample coming out. How much more? about 20%. So you see a better signal as a result on your instrument, about 20% higher. But since there is nothing buffering this mist coming out, you have a higher noise. So yeah, you used to see 
let's say 100,000 counts on your uh, 0.1 ppm standard. But because of the noise, if, you come, if it comes to the detection limit, there is no gain between this spring chamber and this spring chamber in the detection limits. So when to use it? Well, maybe when you need a, a little bit better carryover effect, better inside time, but that's about it. So I, my personal uh, experience, I, I uh, strongly recommend to use spray chamber with baffle unless you're running some agronomy samples and really need to squeeze two or three seconds of rinse out time. So then the question is, why do you have another baffle, which is tube that is uh, narrow? The single reason for that is, uh, and that's why the Prokinoma came up with it, is ability to run organic samples better. And when you say organics, why is that? Because organic samples, in their nature, they are much more volatile than the aqueous. So there is naturally more samples coming out to your plasma, and you need to limit it on certain instruments in order for your plasma to sustain. That's it. So if you look at the description on the website, it's spray chamber used for organic application. This one for inorganic. Okay, now, torch injector ID. This is very often, in my experience, uh, by talking to you, um, some of the users, it's overlooked, both by the user and the by, IC, by ICP manufacturer. So what is the injector ID here? So I put, it varies from 0.8, even probably 0.5 on some instrument, up to three millimeter in diameter. So I took, couple of examples of, of the different torches here which I'm going to pass you so you can take a look at it. So one has a very narrow, well, narrow injector, another one has wide, three millimeters, so you can actually visually evaluate that. So the question is when and why to use you know narrow injector versus the wide one? The rule of thumb is very simple. If you run organic application, the small inject ID is the preferred one. Why? Because you're limiting the amount of sample that's coming out. When you run uh, aqueous samples with high amount of tolerance of solids. In, in, in our example, it's hydraulic fracturing waters, or waters with high salt. You need to have a wider diameter of your injector. So that's why you have this torch, uh, three millimeters. So you can actually run saturated brines with that. So those two different. This is something you have to watch for very carefully. And when you come back, if you don't know, you need to evaluate it. What, is, what are you using on your instrument, right? Whether it's a correct one, because you may be struggling because you just need to change the injector. And modern torches have the, uh, the item mountable, so you can just simply swap the injector, put another one in, and that's it. There are also difference in the materials. It may be ceramic, it may be quartz. It, you know, they have comparable performance. Quartz is a little bit better analytically. It's smoother, you have a bit of a better RSD, but ceramic is more robust. So quartz can be melted if some of your conditions are not right. Ceramic will take more abuse. So people who have you know, less experience, and, uh, so they tend to be more comfortable with ceramic type of injectors. But ability to run tough samples, that will be determined by the in inject ID diameter, not the material as much. Unless you run hydrofluoric acid, mm -hmm. right? That's, then you have to go with ceramic. Okay, so uh, when I say what is, uh, we're talking about the high, uh, samples with high amount of total dissolved solids. Um, the, there is no real definition, um, strict definition of what it is, but if your sample contain about over 10,000 ppm or 1%, so you have to just pay attention to it. Depends on the nebulizer uh, that you use in, in the spray chamber combination instrument, you know, you can go 3%, 5, 10, or even 20 or higher. But over 1%, that's something that you have to look at. 
So also depends on the element. In semiconductor industry, you have all of these guys, uh, got a medium silicon, and you can you know, go to 2 3% and it's going to be no effect. When you run in the um, uh, hydraulic fracture waters, or in even environmental samples, waste waters, even 1,000 ppm of calcium, or 2,000, a few thousand ppm of calcium can cause some issues that needs to be addressed correctly. And the particulates. How to run high soil application. So three key things that probably you've heard from your uh, ICP application people that you work with, or maybe came with your machine that was set up correctly, but if you just started to run something simple and then um, your company started to get into the uh, high salt, high TDS samples, then you need to address it correctly. High salt stabilizer, that's a given, right? So you have to have that, otherwise nothing else will work. Argo, well, I, I'll put this number number two first. Torch with additional gas, and uh, the one of the torches I, I passed to you, uh, it has this adapted end where you can use additional gas that helps to prevent deposition of your injector, but what is also very important is the wide injector ID. So those key things are a must to run high salt. But what also being overlooked at is argon humidifier. And uh, 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 I'll show you the example of it. So this is the torch that I passed to you. So it has this adapter. This, on this torch, in this example, it's built in, but you can get this adapter separately. Your instrument may or may not be set up to get the extra flow here, so then you can get it externally. But what it does, it brings additional gas and it surrounds your sample with this additional gas. And if your sample have high salt, it travels on the, I would say, like a pillow of the other gas. So your sample is not like in direct contact with the inside surface of the injector that helps to reduce the deposition of it. So this is just one example of the argon humidifier. Um, what I've seen is the, the concept of argon humidification is very simple, but for some reason it um, and it's been out there uh, for quite a long time. But what, what we've seen that a lot of users for some reason are not aware of it and never even heard about it, but that's a very uh, this device, it's almost, I would consider it a must if you run high salt application. It's just a container and you fill it up with water. So what happens is this is input and output for your argon flows. Uh, are, you guys, are you guys familiar? Is anyone familiar with argon humidifier? Okay, there we go. So the, the reason for argon humidification is, <clears throat> this is what I call uh, snow making machine effect. So when, uh, I don't know if you have a ski, but uh, if you go to the uh, ski mountain, the way they make a snow is they have a nozzle and they spray water at a high speed. So what happens is that the temperature, because it's very high speed, drops and water turns into the ice. Similar thing happens when you around your nebulizer. So your sample comes in and then goes here to the uh, uh, orifice, if it's not concentric, the concentric, it is in the same position where the sample is, but the gas jet is actually uh, supersonic, so it's pretty high speed. So you get your sample and the temperature drops, and when the temperature drops and you have high salt, what's going to happen? The salts started to build up, and that's what's causing the clogging of your nebulizer. That's one type of the clogging. So the indication of it, you have a back pressure, you started to you know, pulsate, your RSD goes down, your sensitivity drops, all of these effects that you see. So what does the argon humidifier have to do with it? You add a little bit of a moisture to the nebulizer gas flow and that slows this process down. Up to the point that you can run reliably without clogging for week or weeks. Even if you can run 30% saturated brine, for a day 
without plugging anything, any nebulizer, if you have argon humidifier. So let's, let's get a little bit <coughs> into, into the details of you know, what, <coughs> what the uh, high solids nebulizer is capable of and why are they um, uh, high solids capable. So this is the shot of the uh, tip of the optimistic cell nebulizer. And what I wanted to show you is, you see there is a, this is the gas orifice and this is the sample orifice. And the sample out of diameter here for the sample channel is pretty big. It's one millimeter. So it's very difficult to plug, and they are separated here. So this is the actual uh, model of this nebulizer here, where you can see the sample channel and the gas channel are separated. While for concentric and concentric nebulizers, the, it is tube inside the tube, and everything is tiny. So when we look a little bit further, and this is the comparison, <coughs> we just try to put <coughs> those two pictures together. So here is the gas channel on the uh, optimistic cell nebulizer, and this is the gas channel on the concentric nebulizer. See, it's going and, and, and very, so this is the uh, capillary tube, when it comes, it becomes very, very small, very tiny. Um, I don't even know the well, diameter is probably less than 0 0.05 millimeter or something like that. Here, the diameter is around 0.2. So the sample channel is one millimeter here versus a different nebulizer from 0.15 to 0.25. So the gas channel on this nebulizer is as big as, as the sample channel on that guy. So that's the difference. Now that's all geometry behind that, right? All these numbers, but this will give you the, the comparison. So what happens in the, in the real life, why <clears throat> this nebulizer will not clog? Simple geometry. So what happens is you have the sample probe, which varies in diameter between 0.15 millimeters to maybe one. You probably typically run probably 0.8. Then there is a sample line adapter. So that goes from 0.5 to 0.75. And some, um, the manufacturers will put a tiny one of 0.25, but we don't do that because it will clog almost immediately if you have anything there. So then you go from this diameter to wider one, which is one. So what happens? Imagine you have a particle. It will pick it up, it will come through. If it goes through this diameter and comes to wider, it will go through. Nebulizer will just spit it out and you're on fire. On the concentric type of nebulizer, the one I showed in the previous picture, is the other way around. You're going from the wider, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, to 0.25. It's constricted. That's why if you get a particle in, it blocks. Yeah, make sense? Mm -hmm. So here is, <coughs> at, at our booth, I made a shot yesterday, so that shows you the, <laughs> how it looks in the real life. So we put a collar, now we color the sample. See, it goes, and this is the sample channel real nebulizer. So the gas is not seen here, but it's right there. And then goes to the spring chamber. So that to, to illustrate the concept of it. Okay, one more parameter that um, you need to be aware of, you need to adjust when you're working with tough samples is the plasma power. Typically, when you run high salt samples or organic samples, you need to increase your power. Why is that? Because you have more sample coming into your plasma, whether it's from high solids or whether because of organics have a high volatility. To keep up with that, you need to jack up, boost up the, the generator power. And you can do it as well. Why would we run the maximum? Well, here's the reason why. This is the um, uh, 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 dependency of the line intensity in, uh, versus the background intensity. And there is a sweet spot here. So you increase your RF power, you increase the intensity of the line goes linear. But background is lower here, and then when it shoots over, you don't want to be in that zone. 
right? But for tough samples, you might have to, right? So you might have to sacrifice that. That's why it's important to balance everything out. But this is so you would you when you when you do tweaking on your instrument. So this kind of a diagram you can keep in mind when you do that. So you increase your power, but do it as least um, to the level less a degree as possible. Okay, <coughs> now. One other thing that <coughs> quite often, <coughs> um, if not overlooked, but they're not really explained um, uh, and, and people don't have a clear understanding, what is the influence of the gas flows? So quite often the installation engineer comes and they set something up and then he leaves and then you end up with, <laughs> with these gas flows and you're afraid to touch anything. So let's just talk a little bit about that. There's no mystery behind that. It's, it ha everything has some physical sense. So this is your plasma, and there are three main flows. The third flow is not shown here, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to you. The most important one is the nebulizer gas flow, or it's called carrier flow, because it carries your sample, if there is a sample. So it goes inside of your torch. And this is the injector of your torch, right? That's a uh, middle tube that you have in this torch that I ask you. So then there is an auxiliary flow that comes uh, on one of the entrances of the torch, and it goes between the um, between the injector and the inner tube of your torch. So if you look inside the torch, there are three concentric tubes, right? Injector, inner tube, and the outer tube. So the uh, jewelry flow or intermediate flow, sometimes referred to, is between those two. And then in this gap between the inner tube and the outer tube is the coolant flow. Okay, so what happens if we change stuff? <clears throat> so this is, uh, I've been taking this picture uh, from the real plasma. In both applications, that we are uh, focusing to the, or oh, I'm using it as an example, right? For, for tough samples or difficult samples to handle. Whether it's uh, organics, tough organics, uh, oils, uh, or samples with high amount of solids. In both of these applications, you need to increase your auxiliary flow. Why is that? What is the effect of it? The effect of it if it lifts the plasma up. Yes. Further, your goal is to lift the plasma up from the injector surface. That's all it does. <coughs> so imagine you have a ball in your hand, right? Or well, let's say this is this is the torch. This is the torch and this is your plasma. You increase your jewelry flow, your plasma will go up. So if you decrease it, the bottom of the plasma will touch the injector of your torch. What's going to happen? At least you will start to get a deposit of the salt in case of high salt samples or carbon deposit in case of organics. This is the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is going to what? Melt your injector. What, how much to increase it? <coughs> Rule of thumb, you double it as compared to normal or default conditions. And then you look at your plasma, you see how it goes, you try it. If you see carbon deposit, you try to increase it more. So well, why, why don't we just boost it up you know, even higher, as much as we can? The problem is the plasma, two reasons. <clears throat> um, so the plasma becomes become unstable. It's maybe at some point it will be difficult to sustain. Reason number two, so you're moving it up uh, and your sensitivity for some of the elements drops. And if you look at full level, so you have to find a compromise. So all these parameters <coughs> work in a concept. Uh, the, uh, sem so this is the auxiliary flow. So for those applications, this is, this is the one of the critical parameters that just quite often overlook. The nebulizer gas flow, right? So that's, uh, uh, sorry, go back. So this flow right here. <coughs> so that's also very important, but that's something that you 
probably paying more attention to. What is the approach? The same thing, typically, if you're running tough samples, both organics or inorganics with high salt, you decrease it, the nebulizer flow. So auxiliary goes up, nebulizer flow goes down, and the plasma goes up. So those three parameters work in concert, like symphonic orchestra, right? So you change one and everything goes off balance. So typically you <coughs> decrease the nebulizer flow. But, so well, to what degree? <coughs> um, it has certain limit. You can't go very low because you'll lose everything. you lose the sensitivity. Um, if, if you can achieve less sample into your plasma, that's basically what it does, or you change in the zone slightly. <coughs> uh, you can do it with the change in the pump tubing ID and make it a bit smaller so you can get less sample in the plasma. So this is the, the second choice. <coughs> When you change in the nebulizer flow, there is a lot of things happening into the plasma. Um, well, before we go with the yellow, let me mention to you one thing <coughs> as well. The third flow that I did not show on the screen is the coolant flow. And that flow runs about uh, quite high. If, if a jewelry and nebulizer is around 1 liter per minute from 0.5 or 0.4, depends on the instrument to 1, maybe 1.2, Coolant flow is around 12 to 16 or 18 liters per minute. This is your highest argon consumption. So what it does, it it cools um, it cools the plasma <coughs> right here. So when you increase, so it runs between the inner and outer tube, and uh, so when you run higher power, which is required for both of these applications, you're putting more strain into the port scorch. Because this torch is, is made from quartz. There are some ceramic ones, but they're pretty expensive. So what happens if you know you get the temperature up, then you get a little bit of a overheating or sudden temperature change, and you have a crack in the torch or it's gonna be demitrified faster. So to counter that issue, you increase your uh, sorry, coolant flow when needed. So typically by one or two liters per minute, so you see how it goes. You obviously don't go too far, but this is the variation in coolant flow is very marginal. So you may be going from 12 to 14 or 16 liters per minute. <coughs> so here is the visualization of what happens when you change your nebulizer flow. And quite often uh, you ask, well, how I put my nebulizer flow? So here is the very simple test that you can run in your lab, it's called yttrium bullet test. So you run, you take 10,000 dpm yttrium standard, or, and, and then you use it maybe to five, uh, yeah, 5,000 dpm, minimum of one or two, otherwise you're not gonna see anything. Here, for better visualization, it's about 10,000 dpm. And you can visualize different zones of the plot. So this is the um, excitation zone, this is the emission zone, this is the recombination zone. So this is radial plasma, <clears throat> this is axial. And what you're looking for is this spot right here, when red or orange changes to the blue. That's what's called bullet. When you run organics, you don't see these different colors, but you will see a green bullet from your kerosene or any other solvent. So you can see it as well. You can also see it with sodium, but then everything gonna be yellow. So this is just for better visualization. <clears throat> uh, where to put it? Different manufacturers, and the, here's the key, recommend it in about a different spot. Typically on the radial instrument, in between the top loop of the coil and the end of your torch. See, it's right there in the middle. So this is an example of what, it's all axial plasma, axially viewed. I mean, I can turn it uh, 90 degrees just to, you know, demonstrate it. But see here, the red zone is right there. It's hiding behind the second loop of the coil. So that nebulizer flow is turned down. So if you increase it, it will go up here. If you decrease it, it will go the other direction. 
So that's something you have to keep in mind <coughs> when you're changing the nebulizer flow parameters based on the accommodation or everything else because it will change the sensitivity <coughs> of the elements that you're looking for because the zone is going to be moving uh, relative to the observation of your uh, uh, machine. The other effect on the same thing is actually from your injector ID and that's um, very often also overlooked. Uh, just recently uh, we got a, um, a calls from some of our customers so they get a new instrument and uh, they used our nebulizer on the other 10 instruments from um, um, uh, one of the major ICT manufacturer. And then they called and said, Sir, hey, we, uh, our potassium numbers are not good. So the same nebulizer worked on their 12 ICPs, they get a new machine and something wrong with potassium. So we started to look at that, and as it turns out, the new instrument came with a narrow injector ID of 1.5 and they were using 2 because they were running high salt. So what happened as a result of it, so the position of the plasma here, it will, uh, of this bullet, it, it went up. When it goes up with the radial view, so there are two effects going here. It cools the plasma and the observation of the, uh, of the zone moves up. So Potassium, which is very sensitive to any temperature changes because it's easy to analyze element, it just goes and, 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 and becomes non-linear. So they were not getting good numbers. So when we talked about it and we figured this out, and the manufacturer just you know didn't tell well this is how the instrument comes with as a default with 1.5 and nobody looked that these guys were using two. So I said, okay, we'll while we're shipping you the injector with wide diameter. The only thing you, that you can do to keep running for these couple of days, or day when you're waiting for this, decrease the nebulizer flow, come look at this bullet. This is what they've done, but I see went back. That's it. This is the practical implication of all these flows. Again, this is not quite uh, <clears throat> uh, naturally, you know, uh, seen, so <laughs> I... <laughs> To explain you this effect, this is what, you know, we, we, we did, we shot a little video here with, with my daughter. So what I call, you know, the garden hose effect. So what it's going to do, it will show you the stream of the water coming of the garden hose, and then she will decrease the diameter of the hose, and you will see it will shoot up. So she's going to be turning the nozzle. And see, it shoots further up, right? So this is exactly what's happening when you put wider or narrow torch on your ICP. Because if your nebulizer set to run, let's say, 0.7 liters per minute, so what happens, your, your machine has a mass flow controller that says, okay, I need to give 0.7 liters per minute. And whether you have this opening or this opening, is going to be keep kicking it, right? So when you go from here to here, it will apply, you know, the same flow, but the, the, the pressure is going to be different. And then, as a result, the velocity of your flow, the flow is not going to change. Velocity is going to change. The same effect here. So what we see on, uh, how it's going to be seen on, on the instrument, so this bullet point is going to go up here. So when you go from why to narrow or the other way around? You got it, right? <coughs> okay, well, that's, yeah, that's just too distracting. Okay, <coughs> so um, now we're going to be looking back uh, to the nebulizer. So I'll show you the, um, this is the salting up effect on the concentric nebulizer uh, that run without humidifier. But this is also, this is the, uh, I just want to show you the, illustrate the, the effect of um, in, not using argon humidifier of even on non concentric nebulizers. Looking at the gas orifice, see that side? It's built inside there. So this is what's happening. And you don't see that. So what is the indication? The 
the thing that you can uh, diagnose yourself or kind of a find and uh, um, this is when you're looking at uh, like why my sample is clogging, right? So we, we again one of the real life examples. <clears throat> so we get we get a call from the customer and say, well, I'm running the nebulizer, concentric nebulizer, and, it, and it's clogging. So then my next question is, what is exactly clogging? There are two types of how the nebulizer can fail on clogging. So both nebulizers have two channels always. One carries the sample, right? Remember I showed you this slide. And another one carries the gas. <clears throat> both of them can stop working. Typically, on the concentric type of samples, <coughs> on the concentric type of nebulizers, because they have a tiny sample channel, if you have particle, it gets stuck here, and then what is the indication? It's very simple. So your pump is going to try to turn, and no sample is going to come out of the orifice. It will stop nebulizing. Okay, completely. Quite often, or sometimes, the pump will keep running, and then imagine you have you have pump that's working against something that cannot go through. It keeps building a pressure, and then your tubing that's connected without it, it will pop up. Yeah, there we go. So this is a clear indication that you have clogged in the sample channel. So then you have to look what nebulizer you're using, why is the particle go there, and then you can go from there. You change the nebulizer. Or, or filter your sample, or do something else. Recently, I've learned, and you can also <coughs> learn as well, with the saturated high salt samples, if, um, if it's not um, rinsed periodically, so if the, uh, if the sample is so saturated, after the run, overnight, if there is some residue left, so they can crystallize and they can block large orifice even on the best high solid nebulizer. It was hard for me to believe that that's a fact. But that's you know, a little bit of extreme when, um, when you take in um, uh, fracking water and when you're using it not 1 to 10 but 1 to 5 or, or smaller to get better detection limits. Yeah, you can still run it, whether I'm talking on instrument, but uh, um, I think a rinse at the end of the run is, is very important to prevent that. So here is another non-concentric nebulizer. See, look at this large opening here. It's very clean. This is the sample. But this is the salt. And this is the gas channel here. The salt building up all around. What is the indication of that type of climbing? Look at the back pressure. It's called back pressure or pressure applied to your nebulizer. On all the modern instrumentation, it's monitored by the software or should be monitored or you have a gauge on your instrument. What is the rule of thumb here? <clears throat> Let's say when you're running everything clean with 45 psi or maybe it will show kilopascals, uh, that's another unit of pressure, your sample flow should be 0.6 or 0.7 liter per minute. Again, it has a mass flow controller. If these things start to happen, you may not notice it only in your result, but it will try to apply the same flow even the orifice becomes smaller, right? Like in the case of the garden hose getting smaller, just more pressure coming in to get you the same flow. Uh, what is the indication? Your pressure or back pressure on your instrument is going to go up. So if you normally see the three bars of 45 psi, you'll see 60 or higher. That's a clear indication that something is not working. So you probably get, get something like that. Now, there is a cure for that. The cure for that, again, as I mentioned, is the argon humidifier. So this is just an example of how it's set up on one of the instruments. So sometimes people say, well, <coughs> we have a clogged in nebulizer, we need to filter our samples. So they go and filter their samples has nothing to do with that, right? So the cure, or the way to fix it, just add argon humidifier. Forget about filtering, right? So that's how it's very important to diagnose correctly what is actually clogging on your net.
right? And you can do it yourself or, or with a little help. Okay, how are we doing for time, All right? So here is another portion of, um, uh, or part of the parameter that you deal with, and again, it may be, you know, quite often overlooked. So we showed a video of influence of the uh, pump tube ID, black, black, small one, orange, orange is the wider one, on uh, uh, how the mist is generated. Just watch this video for a sec. So you see this, the bit of, uh, you know, it goes and pulsates. So this comes from the rollers of your peristaltic pump. So the high amount of rollers on your instrument, the less pulsation. That's a non-concentric one. On the concentric, to the advantage, you don't see as much of effect because it's also self-aspirating. But for this application, as we just discussed, you need to work with high solids capable nebulizers, which all of them, if they handle particles, are going to be non-concentric. So then you have another video when there's a wider <coughs> diameter of the tube and faster sample uptake rate. So look what happens. See, there is a more consistent mist. So this is something that you need to keep in mind where you bounce your parameters. So you get the nebulizer and say, oh, well, my RSD is high. This is one of the reasons why it could be high. So if you have a small tubing ID, and you need to either, if you don't want to change the tubing, that's fine, but you need to increase the sample uptake rate, if you can, because there is a limit to it for the reason that we already talked about. Okay, so let's look at some of the data. Um, <clears throat> in this particular uh, example, one of the things when you when you when you deal with tough samples, right, is figure out the correct dilution factor, whether it's fracking waters or whether it's tough organics. If you're not concerned with the detection limit, then you know one to ten, everything will come. But we're talking about difficult stuff, right? So detection limit is pressed. So the less the dilution, the better for the detection limit. But then you're running into the some issues, maybe the cell with plasma overload or things like that. You can do it up to a certain limit. The best dilution factor is what? One, right? No dilution at all. But in real life, you have to. So for these particular samples here, that's a um, uh, result we get from uh, one of our customers, one to five. And with non-concentric nav, the reason I put it in is to show you the precision that you can get. This is the internal standard. It gives you 0.1% uh, RSD, uh, or, or um, uh, right here, 0.8. So it's pretty decent precision considering the sample type and the nebulizer type. It's, it's not typically seen on that, but this is what you can get. Um, here is the other example of it maybe not directly related to <coughs> uh, to your um, to the petrochemical industry, but the reason I put it in is <coughs> to show you the performance on potassium when everything is balanced and when the sample has partic particulates in very tough matrix, which you guys will be dealing with very tough matrix, so you get almost perfect calibration curve in four nines, and so in this particular lab, two hundred ten of the fertilized extracts were analyzed back to back between two nebulizers, which is non-concentric high solids and the uh, concentric sea spray, typically. So the argument that you hear, well, we need to run concentric because it provides better precision, RSD. That is true for certain nebulizers and for clean samples. But when you get it a real stuff, look what happens. The precision on the non-concentric guy, an optimistic cell, is better, lower, than the precision of the concentric of the system. So this is very uh, uh, non-intuitive result, but that's, that's true. Okay, well, I want to thank you for your attention. I left specifically some time for uh, answer your questions, and uh, if you can maybe get um, hopefully try to address one of the challenges that you guys have. So please, anyone. So when is the best way to clean the toilet? Is it just 
best way to clean the torches. Uh, best way to clean the torches is not to get them dirty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, clean the torches are very, very often uh, we, we deal with that. Depends on what you're running. If you're running inorganic samples, so the best way to clean it is just to soak in a very diluted um, nitric acid. Yeah, so you don't go on the concentration because with the time it may, you know, yeah. But rather than that, yeah, if you have a deposit there with organic, so you can just rinse it out or soak it in 5 to 10 percent nitric. I won't go any more than that. If you have a bit of a discoloration on the torch, <coughs> that's natural. And it, normally people concern, well, it doesn't look great, right, but it's cosmetic. It will have no effect on the performance. One thing that you need to be focused on when you clean the torch is to keep the health of your injector in check. Because if, if the injector is corroded, that will get your performance down. If you have on the uh, outer shield of the torch, if you get a little bit of a discoloration or even deutrification, it's fine. You're not going to lose any performance. As a matter of fact, um, where are the torches? Right here. Yeah. So we offer a restoration uh, service for the torches. When uh, the torches are devitrified, and they are devitrified mainly on the outer shield. So you run this, and then you get this whitish color, and then it starts to flake off. But when we receive the torch, so we look at the injector. If the injector surface is good, it's not corroded, we repair the torch. So our glass blowers will cut it out, put a new tube in, seal it, you get this, it looks like a brand new. So the, the cost is about half of the cost of the brand new torch, roughly. But uh, yeah, that's, that's to answer your question. So the, the key factor in decision that we make, or our glass blowers make when they receive the torch, whether it's repairable or not, the condition of the injector, not the other issue. So you have some. I'm everything good. is addressed. I, I'm good. <laughs> okay. After your last slide, please really tell me because phosphorus was was one of my problems. Yeah. Phosphorus. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's talk about phosphorus. Yeah. Yeah. In uh, thank you. In uh, hydraulic fracturing business, phosphorus is the critical element. And that's why you need to get to the best detection limits possible. Um, if you have, you know, different instruments have different you know, limitations, but typically um, uh, there are four phosphorus lines that you can use. Two of them are the most sensitive ones. So actually, I have it. Yeah, I have some phosphorus peaks in my other presentation, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Two of them in the low UV part of the spectral range. When I say low UV, it is below 200 nanometers. 177 and 178, two excellent super sensitive lines. But in order to run it on the, the shell type of uh, uh, optic spectrometer uh, with its broken armor or thermal or, or agilent, <coughs> you need to perch your optic for a long time, for a few hours before you can effectively measure them. But those two lines uh, will provide you best detection. The ultra 178 actually, 177.5, so I have some covering appearance. Uh, the other two lines are on 213.6 and 214. So you can work with those as well, but they're gonna be less sensitive. That's, that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, I know some primary users um, uh, try to do the you know purging and then trying to measure it with maybe uh, purging with nitrogen and things like that. So if you're trying to do all of that, this is where you can squeeze the best uh, out of your performance for phosphorus. The, the real question is, I if you use one of these wider um, injectors, injector nebulizer, which is the lower limit that you could detect for phosphorus in your experience? Uh, I have to. That, that's a good question. Well. Uh, I know on the spectro, and I have a data uh, somewhere here, it was 10 parts per billion at least. 
-hmm. On uh, Perkinon, also with, with our nebulizer, <clears throat> you can see you need to have this wide airfoil because it's fracking waters, but you need to combine this with sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know this nebulizer offers this in both. Uh, there are some others one, but the reason I showed it to you, yeah, they will work well, they can handle high salts, but they will not give you the sensitivity for FOSS that you need. You need to squeeze everything out of it. I think these guys, uh, our customers, they run about maybe, uh, they come closer to probably 20 or 30 PPB, something like that. PPB? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but with, with purging and everything else. Okay. Yes. It's, a, it's a little bit of that when I get it because I, I see one BPM with high ISD in a 3% solution. What, what type of nebulizer? Uh, that's what I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, you, uh, that's, that's your homework to find out. I, yeah. I, I am an organic chemist and this is something right. I have to right. do on the side, so... <laughs> yeah, you probably, if it's a Perkinol ray instrument, mm -hmm. you probably... Uh, I, I think I have the ceramic nebulizer from them. Ceramic? Yeah. From, uh, is it ceramic or is, well, if it's a ceramic, it could be a V-spray. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's, my glasses. Yeah, I would definitely change that if that's what you've got. Um, okay. So the standard nebulizer on Perkinomer instrument is this guy. It's mm -hmm. called Gemco. The high solids Gemco is about, we've tested it in our lab, is about a factor of two and a half less sensitive than the optimistic cell. Okay. Factor of two hundred percent. High solids, they Perkinomer offers also a low flow version than the run for organics. That has a bit better sensitivity, but still it's uh, yeah much, much less sensitive. If you have the ceramic one, V spray, that's even worse in sensitivity. Okay. Thank you. I would just curious if you had MDL study between the narrow injector tube versus your uh, injector tube for some of the elements. Have yes, we did. On some, yeah. They, they see, the, the, to run the study like that, yeah, actually, uh, <clears throat> um, I have a recent one. Um, it, it depends on, on the nebulizer. It, it depends also on the instrument. But overall, overall, the concentric type of nebulizers, uh, the one that you mentioned here, the sea spray, or, so they're pretty sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. To compete with these guys, on the detection limit, it's very tough. We did direct comparison. The sensitivity or the signal of the optimistic cell as compared to the uh, sea spray is about, again, depends on the instrument, uh, you're losing about 25 to 15 percent. On Angelum is 20 to 15. On Spectre is 25 to 30. On Thermo, but this is where the bond. So it's not a factor of two that you lose. It's less than that. Instead of million counts, you get 750,000 or 800,000 counts, right? So in water, you will see, you know, other comparable, maybe little Ross RSD. And then that, that's what typically people will show you comparison. Well, you know, it's better. But when you give this nebulizer a real sample, the performance of it degrades very quickly while the performance of Excel stays or becomes even better because it works on a different principle. It's counterintuitive, but it's a fact. That's why I showed you the slides where it outperformed the uh, uh, concentric nebulizer on the precision, which is it's, it's very unheard of in the industry. Um, so when I showed the slides on the conferences, you know, people throw me a lot of questions because that's what not typically expected. But some people in the application lab who work with this nebulizer very closely, they found it very logical because they said, well, we sell sea spray only for clean samples. No problem with that. But when you get it a real, and, and why it's so common? 
it's very easy for the manufacturers, it's industry called industry standard, nothing wrong with the snap, but it has to be used for the right stuff, right? It's like you have a racing car, right? Where are you going to drive the racing car? On the racing track? Yeah, it will perform. Then you put it on the dirty road. I would better do it with my truck, right? Than you with the racing car on the dirty road. The same thing here. It has to be used for the right stuff. If not, it will not perform well. But uh, the, the detection limit wise, um, yeah, it, uh, again, it's, it's difficult to say in, in the water, the sea spray will be giving you better detection limits, but not much better, not like factor of two or three. So a little bit less than that. In the, in the real samples, I think they're gonna be you know, pretty common. As a matter of fact, yeah, um, we did just comparison. One of ICP manufacturer compared our nebulizer versus the uh, uh, conical from the from uh, uh, glass expansion, and uh, for running crude oils, you see better signal from the concentric net. But when it comes to detection limits for phosphorus. Our nebulizer gives it better. Why? Because if you look at the background when you run organics, the background goes way up. Without nebulizer, the background goes up, but not much. With, with the concentric, it goes here. So when you're measuring on this type of a background, your detection limit suffers. So that's what happens when you get a real, a real matrix. I guess I'm a little bit confused because if you are introducing more samples, so you will have more sensitivity. But you're also introducing higher interference if they're present there, right? That's correct. <laughs> Could you increase in that, but you're also increasing interference. Yeah, no, but that's why I said you don't increase the sample amount yeah. when you're running this type of application. You do the other way around. You decrease it. And that's why the high efficiency of the concentric nebulizer in case of organics plays in the opposite direction for the detection limits. When you run clean water, so environment, yeah, you need to you know, get it up there, but um, uh, so that's why also there is a uh, um, cool spray chambers for high volt organics, right? Because it gets too much samples. So what you do, you cool in the plasma. You you do the same effect of decreasing the amount of sample that coming out. Thank you. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So you guys fix uh, for like the top, the outer. I'm sorry? The outer tube of the torch? Yeah, yeah, we do. It's, yeah, 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 we, we, we offer it's this that, service. That's the one that usually gets brittle and kind of Yes, packed. yes. What, what kind of uh, torch? What is the instrument you have? Uh, Agilent. Agilent, which one? 5100? Uh, or just the variant. Oh, the variant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have this on the, yeah, it, it's Axial, right? Mm -hmm. no, uh, it's Axial. Yeah, Axial, yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here is here is the yeah. Uh, this is your torch right here, right? Yeah, that looks right. So the top is you see the one that's brittle. Yeah, yeah. This is the out. Yeah, if you run, yeah, this is very typical on, on what's here. Yeah, absolutely. If if the injector, if the injector here is not corroded, yeah, we replace the outer shield. So the cost of this torch is about three hundred dollars. Roughly, that plus minus. I don't remember the exact price, but somewhere 285. Yeah. So the cost of the repair is about 550, 565, something like that. But the outer uh, torch is really cosmetic. I mean, it does not uh, after the tip. It, it is. But it after the point. Uh -huh. After the point. So yeah, when it started to get set, you can run it yeah. until it starts to flake off. But when when the pieces started to come out of it, so, uh, it's a little bit already. Yeah. Non cosmetic, <laughs> not as much of a cosmetic. It deteriorates because we run the high salts. So. Yes, it deteriorates very quickly, yeah. Because it's presence of sodium, yeah, it, that's what kills the torch. But it's not kill a killing. We can, you say, we can restore it. If you, if you run it fine, you can inject it in the new shape. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a cost saving. Yeah, it usually is. It's the outer yeah, people saving us, you know, 10, 15, 20, some people 20 torches at a time, they just rotate them. You know, 75 here, we fix them. It takes about four to six weeks. The cost is like half of the Half. Half. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely.